<laughs> Hello, welcome to the Sports Heaven January podcast. Today, we have Joel joining us on the phone. Uh, we, we will uh, begin talking about the uh, recent MLB news today coming out. We have Max Scherzer signing a $210 million contract with the Nationals. So uh, what do you think about this uh, contract, Joel? Obviously, it's an extensive one being for seven years. Um, I would be really interested to see if he actually ends up staying there for all those years. But I think the obvious news out of it is now that the Nationals have at least three starters who are you know, proven, at least, that they can definitely do do some damage in the postseason. You know, you have Strasburg. He's, obviously, he hasn't had a ton of postseason experience, but with time, he'll get that. But he's shown he can dominate major league hitters. You already have Doug Fister they acquired last season from the Tigers. Um, there's some debate of whether they're going to trade Jordan Zimmerman or not because they might not currently have enough money to afford Scherzer. So it looks like Zimmerman's going to go. There's also rumors about shortstop Ian Desmond leaving the team, but I'm honestly not sure whether these will actually happen or not. But it sounds like there's going to be some moves that need to be made for the, for the end of the salary cap. Yeah, um, there's been definitely been rumors about Jordan Zimmerman. He is on the last year of the contract. I do think the Nationals can get some good value out of them. Definitely moving that contract that he has, and then bringing back some nice prospects. Yeah, absolutely. Jordan Zimmerman had that three twenty four year ERA last year, but in his career, excuse me, two sixty six last season. He's had a really solid MLB career so far. It's only been like four years, a little over. But like, I, I'm not really sure what what kind of moves they need to make. But unfortunately, it sounds like someone like him is going to have to go. And they did recently just acquire, you know, Escobar. So he is, um, so he will probably start at shortstop for them next year, which basically clears up space and get rid of Ian Desmond. Yeah, they, they definitely can uh, make some good moves to clear up some of that cap space. I definitely agree. But right now, the Nationals definitely have the best starting rotation in baseball. Scherzer, Fister, Zimmerman, Zimmerman Strasburg, and Gio Gonzalez. Yeah, it seemed like when the uh, Tigers brought back David Price, what they were kind of saying, they didn't expect they'd be able to get uh, Scherzer back. And it's a great move for the Nationals, if, I mean, uh, if everything works out. But, I mean, I, I'm not sure if I'm ready to call the best yet. I mean, it looks really good on paper, but I, I'm not sure. Let's see how the season goes first, you know. <laughs> All right, well, sounds good. Um, so there was another big NBA trade today. De- um, Dexter Fowler, Fowler came over to the Cubs from the Houston Astros. So what do you think about this move, uh, solidifying their outfield? Well, the Cubs keep seeming to make some moves out there. You know, it doesn't seem like they're done for now because this team definitely needs some help. Um, I like I like this move in a lot of ways. It gives them a sure-handed leadoff batter and allows Starlin Castro to move to more than the middle of the lineup. Whereas in years past, they weren't really sure where to put Starlin Castro because he seemed like he was going to want to get on base, you know? So I like that they have Fowler as a definite leadoff hitter. But, I mean, that outfield's all right right now. I'm not sure about Chris Coughlin and left for the future. I think he'll go. Um, I'd like to see the Cubs will get a third base at some point. Some point. I really like my goal over there. A little young. I feel like they could do a lot better with their money. I know they just dished out a ton for Lester and Jason Hamill, but I don't know. I guess we'll see. Well, the Cubs did. Um, well, Dexter Fowler. He only did hit two seventy six last season. Not really a characteristic average for a leadoff hitter, but he did hit ho- eight home runs. Which I mean, that's a little bit of power. But he, he's he just he's on the later end of his contract uh, of his years. I, I know what you're saying. I'm not sure, though. I think he's still... I think there's definitely a lot he can do for this team overall. But I, I think the biggest thing is speed is what he's always been talking about, you know? But last year, he was kind of... He only had a, he didn't have as many stolen bases last year. He's kind of been up and down between the minors and the majors the last couple of years a little bit, whether he's on rehab or not. I'm, I mean, like he's, he's only had a few major league seasons under his belt, so it's really going to be... I mean, it's interesting to see with a team like this where he's got more hitters in the middle of the lineup for once. See if that actually helps or not. Yeah, Dexter Fowler did only have 11 uh, home runs last year. For, um, I'm sorry, stolen bases last year for the Astros. Um, so the what the uh, Cubs ended up having to give up was Luis Valbuena, which is an infielder, and then Dan Straley. So it wasn't like a, that big of a uh, gamble to get Dexter Fowler, but it's definitely going to be nice to have some better leadership on that team. Yeah, absolutely. He's played enough. And, you know, he's played in Colorado, and he played a year in Houston. But um, I, I think coming to the Cubs, this is something that I think is really going to help him a lot. It provides a lot of speed in the outfield. Can get, I mean, Wrigley Field is obviously a hitter's ballpark, but I think he'll definitely help him defensively, too. Sounds good. So there are a couple more uh, free agents still left to sign before pitchers and catchers report. One of the big names is James Shields. There's been 
some rumors that the uh, Tigers are now interested since they lost Serzer, and then the Cubs are also interested. Um, there, and there's also been a um, uh, closed, closed, um, a closed uh, door discussions with the Blue Jays. Where do you think uh, James Shields can land? That's I, I think it's honestly a really tough call because it seems like he could fit on a lot of these teams out there because several teams have already lost obvious pitchers. Um, sending him to the Cubs, I mean, him signing with the Cubs really is interesting. But, I mean, he's, he's another right-hander is real strong. I think right now the Cubs need to work on, you know, like I said, a third baseman or maybe a left fielder as of now. But um, I can see that. Um, like, uh, Tigers, I don't know how they're going to be on money. It's It might be, you might not see James Shields get signed until February, closer to spring training time, because someone may get hurt in like a informal workout or something, and they may need him. But, I mean, based on his postseason he had, I mean, there's not going to be a lot of teams saying, oh, this is a must-have pitcher. So I think he's going to hang around a little bit longer than we're expecting. But, I, honestly, I'm not quite sure where he could head right now. Well, do you think if he, he uh, takes till February or March to sign, do you think that will influence the start of his season and his, his performance at all? Um, I think there will be some, a little bit more rust than usual to shake off. But, um, it's... Tough to say on that. Stuff. I mean, I know you mentioned the Blue Jays getting him. It's I mean, you have a catcher like Russell Martin there, who's obviously more experienced. He's, a, he's always been known as a pitcher's catcher. But um, I'm, I'm not really sure. I, I think he'd be a little bit rusty. And based on his stats, you know, you would you know what you're going to get from James Shields. You're probably going to get three or he's going to get three or four runs. But I, I really don't know. I, I don't think he's going back to the Royals. I think that's easy to say because they have enough other players coming up. I mean, Jordan Ventura already showed he could probably be their number one guy this year. But um, I don't know. I guess, I mean, if the Tigers can get into a cheap contract, then I would see it going there, frankly. Yeah, Shields is projected to get between seventy and eighty million dollar contract, but he he last year he's only had a three point two one ERA and a one uh, eighteen WHIP. I mean, those aren't fantastic sets. I mean, they're really good. I'm just not sure though that he could definitely be an ace on a team. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, he showed in the postseason he's not quite big game James, as the Royals fans kept calling him. I mean, at several appearances, he just did not seem like he was up to the task, you know. And I think that showed in the World Series against the Giants, you know. You get a little bit better starts, and maybe, maybe the Royals end up winning. You know, he'll face past the thumb corners many times either. But um, I, I really don't know. I don't think James Shields is worth as much, that much, but I... I, I wouldn't be surprised if someone pays him that just because they need a big name pitcher like him. Yeah, pitchers definitely can command a lot of money on the open market. It's just going to be uh, interesting to see how Shields, uh, how much Shields will get. He's definitely going to be a wild card for any team. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, um, with since the Royals did lose Shields and the Tigers now lost Max Scherzer and Rick Porcello earlier this season through a trade, who do you think's going to come out of the AL Central this year? Um, well, that's really interesting. I like I like the Tigers again, honestly. As much as they've been disappointing in recent years, I think it's safe to say that they're a fair bet because their pitching is still... I mean, if you get Justin Verlander back to normal, normal as in his superhuman status, that is. I mean, if you get him back to that, that would be very interesting to see. That That's a big I, if, know, though. Do, yeah, I agree, but I don't think that division is honestly that strong enough for one team to run away with it like the Tigers might have done before. I think that time has gone to them. You know, they're they're facing some stiffer competition this year. Verlander just keeps kind of keeps declining. Now Scherzer's gone. They lost Fister the year before. It's it's really tough to see what's going to happen. Them. Well, uh, the Royals definitely lost some players. But they took a ton of steps forward. I'm not quite sure if they can win the division. I mean, I guess you got to say, what about the White Sox, though? They just acquired Jeff Samarja, they got David Robertson, and Malky Cabrera. They made some really quiet moves, but based on their pitiful season last year, I don't think they're quite there yet, you know? Yeah, I think they need maybe a year or two experience, maybe uh, another acquisition or two to really be able to make an impact. Well, what about the, the uh, Cleveland Indians? They definitely, they might not quite be there yet, but late last season, they definitely made a pitch. Um, a definitely made a run towards the postseason. Yeah, absolutely. Michael Brandley's one of the best outfielders in baseball. I think he's probably the most underrated outfielder in baseball. He made a case for the MVP last year. But, um, I mean, look at, I mean, as good as he was, look at how bad Nick Swisher was. You know, he lost so much playing time because of that. But, I mean, obviously with the rotation, looks really good with Corey Kluber, the reigning Cy Young winner. 
they named him Carlos Carrasco. He also did really good if he comes back. Um, I mean, I'm not really sure. Actually, he is coming back. My mistake. He didn't sign a deal. But I, I, I like that. I like their pitching. But I, I don't know. You know what I mean? It's really, I said, they're real tough teams. They started last year so pitiful, and they came back and did real well. I guess you got to look at it, and you got to see what about um, Michael Bourne. If he stays healthy, he could be really dangerous. People kind of forgot about him. But I don't know if the Indians are quite – I think the Indians will make the playoffs, frankly, but I don't think they're that bad. But I don't know if they're quite ready for the division. Yeah, there's definitely – there's probably about four teams that could win the division if any number of circumstances go right. It's, it'll be very interesting to uh, see what comes out of there. Yeah, I think right now my safe bet would have to still be the Tigers as long as they still have Miguel Cabrera and Victor Martinez. Sounds good. So let's transition to the uh, NHL All-Star game. So there's been a couple of uh, new names come in, you know, the you know the normal rookies, the um like Flip Forsberg and Mike Hoffman. So what what do you think's going to happen at the All-Star game this year? Well, uh, so the first All-Star game we've really had since 2012 because of the lockout in 2013 and the Olympics last year. So, I mean, really it's it's I I think this is just going to be more this is nice for the players. They get a quick little break, yeah, you just get to play. You get to play a game with a lot of other players that you don't usually get to. Um, the NHL All Star Game seems like it's kind of lost the appeal with fans because I mean, because uh, there's no defense played it, similar to like the NBA All Star Game or the NFL Pro Bowl. But the skills competitions are always really neat. The NHL, it's, I, I'm not sure though. It's just I, I honestly I might not even watch it. It's just not that interesting to see anymore. The neat thing that the NHL did try, I thought, it was 2012 or 2011, excuse me, when they started doing them. Um, they had like a, it was like a fantasy draft style. You had two captains who would pick the teams, and I always thought that was kind of neat. Like this year, the captains are Nick Foligno of the Columbus Blue Jackets from the host city and Jonathan Taves from the uh, Chicago Blackhawks. Oh, that's kind of neat that they get to pick their own teams. But frankly, I I, I still don't think it's going to be that interesting, you know. <laughs> It seems like either way, Sidney Crosby will probably be the first pick, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's always name. It's always the name over the stats, what I've come to see in All-Star games. But the, what I found was very interesting this year is that top five, five of the top six players that got the max amount of votes were all Chicago Blackhawks players. Yeah, yeah, that was um, really interesting. I do remember seeing that. Uh, frankly, I think that's based on their success in recent years. You know, that's... um. They have more of an established hockey town there. Whereas, you know, you see the Los Angeles Kings are the reigning Stanley Cup champions. It's not quite a hockey city, you know, even though they've won two in the last three years. I think the Chicago Blackhawks have a strong following nationwide because they've got really well-known players. You know, Jonathan Taves, Patrick Kane, Duncan Keith, and Brent Seabrook are right up there in the, among the top defensemen in the league. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I was kind of surprised to see Corey Crawford be one of the first to get in. But um, I, I think he deserves it. So, I mean, I, I had no complaints about being the first ones. It was just a little surprise. Yeah, it just seemed like there was a little bit too many Blackhawks. I know they're probably the number one team in the NHL right now, with definitely one of the favorites to win the Stanley Cup. But, I mean, five of the top six, I mean, that's really uh, something I would say. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, I, I agree with most of these decisions, I thought, for this one. But, like, I, I'm not, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I just wrote an article yesterday about the New York Islanders talking about how they deserve more of a chance. I would have liked to have seen a couple more of their players get in. You know, I was glad to see that Yara Halak and um, Jonathan, uh, John Tavares got in. I kind of thought Kyle Oposo might have been right on the edge of getting in or not, but I'm not really sure who who, who, who he wouldn't have taken a spot of, you know? Yeah, they, have, they seem to have a lot of, like, borderline players with the All-Star game, which... I give them credit for because they they added a lot in the off season that made that team a lot better how they were last year when they lost to the Penguins in the uh, playoffs. But the Islanders are definitely going to be a force to be reckoned with this year. They have definitely showed that in the uh, regular season. Yeah, absolutely. As for this All Star game coming up, though, it's kind of just like I mean, we'll see how the skills competition go. But I honestly don't expect great ratings. Frankly, I think All Star games might across all sports they might almost be on the decline. You know, the only one that only seems to have any meaning anymore is the baseball one. Then he complained about the, uh, the fight for the home field advantage in the World Series. Frankly, I think that's why most people watch that one, you know? Yeah. It, hockey, but, there's no incentive. Basketball, no incentive. And there's no history in the hockey one. There's hardly any history with it. You know what I mean? 
baseball has had plenty of big moments from it, whether it was Ted Williams hitting a home run to win it, or, I mean, as you look at basketball, there's been plenty of comebacks in those, you know, I remember Allen Iverson led one. It's, there's not much with hockey, and that might be on the decline. I mean, frankly, it's almost like, why don't they even have anymore? I almost feel like hockey hasn't had the chance to have a big play or a big moment in their All Star game. They're still a relatively, I would say, new sport for the uh, to be for pop for popularity. I mean, it's def- the popularity is ri- definitely rising. But like in the '80s, '90s, no one really watched hockey. Nobody really knew the stars. Which I think the hockey's All Star game that this is now or never for when they can make their big moment. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. But um. I don't even think I'll watch this, to be honest. There's just, there's not a lot going on. It's neat that they switched the format, but, um, I, I, it's whatever. I'd rather just watch a, a slate of games instead, you know? <laughs> yeah, so, uh, enough hockey. So let's, uh, switch over and talk about the, uh, uh, NFL happening yesterday. The Seahawks definitely um, overcame the Green Bay Packers late in overtime to uh, take a 28-22 uh, win over the Green Bay Packers to advance to their second straight Super Bowl. First time, first team to do that since New England, which who they will be playing in the Super Bowl, who handily beat the Indianapolis Colts 45-7. Now, in that game, there has been a little bit of controversy over deflated balls. Um, what do you think about the... Um, the uh, reports about that, Joel? Uh, honestly, I've seen that. I haven't paid a ton of attention because it's, it, I, I mean, I'm not a Patriots fan by any means, but it's kind of annoying. You know, it seems like every time they've done something about this cheating or not, but it seems like other teams will say, oh, well, we kind of did the same thing too. It's, you know, it's almost that the Patriots are only getting caught because they've been in enough big games because they're on success. But this deflated ball thing, I'd say, is like, you know, if there was a complaint on the Colts side, why wouldn't they say anything to the referees during the game? You know? We've seen instances like this in other sports where a player has, where players have been cheating and they've been caught mid game. But like, look at Michael Pineda of the New York Yankees last season when he had the pine tar in his neck, the Red Sox pointed it out in the middle of the game and the game was ejected. If this had really been a problem during the game, I think the Colts would have done something about it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I agree. I mean, it, a deflated ball, that's not that big of a deal. I mean, you get a little bit of grip, but what, seriously, what's that going to do? It's not going yeah, to I mean, replace a 38-point deficit. Exactly, exactly. The Colts were not ready for this game, and it showed, you know, so, and that's that. And that's that. I just, I just kind of just made me think about how good the Patriots were compared to everybody else in the AFC. I mean, usually division games are not, uh, I'm sorry, championship games are not this big of a blowout. Looking at just the the, um, the Seattle the Green Bay game, but this one, this wasn't even close. Now, the fact that Andrew Luck can even throw for a touchdown, it's just, he's not quite a Tom Brady level. Andrew Luck's shown a ton of potential, but his time isn't quite here yet. And I think you get him a couple more years, you get some improvement on this team. They don't know if some guys are coming back. You know, you don't know if Reggie Wayne will be back with this team. He didn't have any receptions in this game. But I mean, it's time to start saying, you know, what if a guy can like him, like Hakeem Nicks, what if he could step up to help, you know? If you're going to have T.Y. Hill coming back, to will have cleaner. It's just, there's a lot of hope for the Colts. But I think they're not quite ready for face someone like the Patriots. They're not quite as tough. Yeah, I'm. I'm not quite sure the Patriots have all the tools necessary. I mean, their running back um, position is questionable at best with the disappointment of Trent Richardson. I mean, they have T. Y. Hilton definitely in the passing game, which is one of the top wide receivers in the NHL. But after that, I mean, um, Hakeem Nix. I mean, he hasn't done anything since uh, the Giants. And then um, the I just feel like they need another wide receiver. Well, I know what you're saying. I think Hakeem Nix could be that guy if he gets his. If he, if he figures out his potential, how much he has. I'm just saying, someone like him is going to have to step up with Reggie Wayne, but not likely to come back. And I think, yeah, like you mentioned, the running game needs to get a little bit better for the Colts. I mean, it's been, the Trent Richardson didn't even play, didn't play in the last game. He's, I mean, he's been a non-factor since they acquired him, and they expected him to do more. It's time to get a real running back. Whether you draft him, whether you sign one, you have to do something about it. Yeah, it's, I think that's time, because... Like, Eric Blunt didn't even spend this whole season with the Patriots, and he had 148 yards. He just completely ran over the Colts in this whole game. And, you know, and that's just, that's kind of surprising, frankly. Yeah, I mean, the Colts' defense isn't what you really talk about as being one of the elite ones, but it's definitely one of the better ones, and this was just embarrassing. Yeah, I, I definitely see what you're saying. They need to do a little bit better with the, the uh, time of possession and definitely controlling that. I mean, I think they almost need to spend, like, maybe a first or a second round draft pick 
with a running back this year. I mean, I mean, I think it's time to get rid of Trent Richardson. I don't think we'll see him playing again for the Colts just because of how little he's done. But I, I'm not really sure. I just I would like to see what they're going to do in the future because it's just it's not a lot of hope right now. You know, to be honest. But I like I like where they're going. I think the Colts are definitely an above average team. But when I said there's not a lot of hope, I mean you say what if you're going to run to another tough team like the Patriots? You know, it's this has happened so far all of Andrew Luck's career. You know, he's used to this now. And it's time for him to learn from it. And I guess we'll see if he does. You know, it was, they took a step forward when they beat the um, Broncos, but one could argue, you know, with Manning playing hurt and then already being a slumping team, was it that great of a victory? I think in a way it was, but I, I think by losing to the Patriots, they're showing that they're not quite an elite team. I mean, besides, the Patriots are obviously number one, but I mean, the Colts, I would definitely say that could be a number two team in the uh, AFC right now. I mean, they're just a really big gap with uh, Brady playing the way he's done, he is, and especially with Gronk um, definitely healthy. I mean, the Patriots are a darn good team right now. Yeah, I agree. I'm just saying, what if, I don't know. If things have been differently, I wonder, you know, say the Colts played the Ravens in the playoffs in the round before, if that had happened. I honestly think the Ravens probably would have won that game. They had a meeting early in the year. It came down to like the last play, and the Colts barely hung on. It's just, I think the Colts have done well like, the, in these past couple of years when Andrew Luck has made this brought them to the postseason. But I think they're getting a little lucky at times, you know? Yeah, each each year it seems like the Colts progress progress more and more. I just think they need to take that Despite big step. getting farther, too. That's yeah. the answer. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, they just need to make that next big step and get get up to and uh, get up to the Super Bowl. Absolutely. So, um, what do we have any uh, super uh, Super Bowl predictions? Uh, Seattle, uh, New England. Who do you think is going to win? Uh, well, wow. I think it's a little. I don't know if I'm quite ready to digest that after yesterday's Seahawks Packers game. To tell you the truth, you know what I mean? It was like, such a, it was such a crazy day uh, game. They were down. They were down what uh, twelve with three minutes left. Yeah, that was that was wild. I mean, I'm, that was <laughs> it's hard to really describe that game. What happened? It just, I mean, it, everything went perfect. Really, that's the simplest way to put it. You know, there's ten fifty three left in the fourth, and the Packers add on to their lead. It's nineteen seven after a Mason Crosby field goal. And, you know, and then they go down the field. There was that one through. There was the throw to Lynch where they thought he scored and he stepped out of bounds. And shortly after, Russell Wilson scores. And the fact that they got the onside kick back and then Marshawn Lynch scores to tie it up. But then, you know, the Packers go down the field and they score. It's honestly, it's, it's really strange. I think the strangest thing to me was, I, I think it was, I was impressed with how the Seahawks were able to come, come back. I'll say that at the end of the fourth quarter. Yeah, it definitely it, shows it, like. You don't, you don't see that. There was no signs of life before that, um, the big deal goal where they scored, you know? Before that, you weren't seeing much, and even shortly after that, you barely saw any signs of light, you know? Yeah, it shows that a team, um, it shows real character in a team when they can come back late in the fourth quarter like the Seattle did. But I'm not sure if it was everything with Seattle. The Green Bay kind of just, like, fell apart there at the end. You're not recovering your onside kicks, letting C- uh, Seattle go down three drives in a row and get a touchdown, including um, overtime. It just felt like Green Bay almost gave Seattle that game. You know what? I know what you're saying. I think defensively, Green Bay kind of yes, shut down. Yes. Now, offensively, they were starting to get things going. But then, you know, then Seattle got their one score, but Russell Wilson ran into the touchdown, and then they recovered the onside kick. But look at that next drive after that, when they went down and, and they got Crosby's field goal right before time expired. You yeah. know, Aaron Rodgers was on a roll. It made you kind of wondering if they should have gone no huddle the whole game, for crying out loud, you know? Yeah. Took a minute left. Yeah, that was a minute 11 drive, but they got seven plays, 48 yards. They just they were down the field really quick to get that field goal, you know? You, yeah. you got to think, though, they had had more time. They probably would have gone for six. I think they would have. But at that time, it was right to go for the field goal, I, I believe. Yeah, but throughout the entire game, the Packers just really couldn't put the ball uh, put the ball in the end zone all that much. They had, what, one, two, three, four field goals? Yeah, yeah. Crosby was four for four. He did really good. But at the end of the day, I think what everyone's going to look at from this one, besides the interceptions and besides the comeback, you got to look at the Packers' stats on third down, 3 of 14. You know, Seattle wasn't much better at 8 of 16, but a lot of times when the Packers were, when they were missing those opportunities, you know, four times they kicked field goals. Think about that. You know, they'd be up to 50% if they just scored 
touchdowns or, or even gotten a first down on those third downs. Yeah, you really have to con- you really have to convert those um those uh field goals into t- make those touchdowns. That's how you win a game. Yeah, absolutely. It was just I mean I, I don't know. I think they could have taken better advantage of the Seahawks. They got lucky a couple times on penalties. You know they they had two one of them had two first downs based on a couple penalties. There was one hand to the face one early, early on that really bailed them out. But it's just like. Aaron Rodgers definitely was a little bit off in this game, but it, I really thought there was a couple times where they, they really should have they should have done better. I think they should have gone Eddie Lake before, honestly. I know he had twenty I know he had twenty one carries to be somehow. The way he was going in this game, he kept thinking give him the ball, let him go. Yeah, Eddie Lacey had what seventy three yards. I mean, James Starks he had uh, five carries for forty four yards. He was he got on a roll roll there late. I mean, I'm surprised they didn't give it to him more even. Yeah, I was too. I think Lacey was a little shaken up briefly, so he went out there with Starks, and he got that real big 32-yard run. But, um, I, I mean, I don't know. I think it was they had a solid effort from those two. It's also, you're going to look back to this where you're going to see the passing game. You know what I mean? Jordy Nelson had a couple drops in this one. I know he was defended several tight, pretty tightly. He dropped one in the end zone, I believe, on their first drive of the game. You know, that would have gotten them some points on the board. But, I don't know. You're just going to look back. I think the biggest thing to learn for, for them from this third down stage, you know? Yeah, I'm not too sure that with all these mistakes by Green Bay and how lucky Seattle got, if I would say, I'm not really sure they can really stand up to New England How uh, from uh, how well New England has dominated this season. I mean, I, I, I mean, some people were saying that before last year's Super Bowl and Seattle handed the Denver an, a loss, but I mean, the Pacers just look so much better than Seattle right now. I know what you're saying with that, and I, and to an extent, I agree. But as lucky as Seattle was, Marshawn Lynch still had 157 yards on the ground, and you don't get lucky doing that. You True. know, he had that. And it was, that was probably one of his best NFL games he's ever had. True, and so, they're going to have to do that I again think, if they're going to beat uh, New England. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be really interesting to see how I think what Seattle's going to do instead of trying to rely on Russell Wilson earlier. They're just going to send Lynch at them, and they're going to see how that goes. But I think Russell Wilson can bounce back. And in a way, I would argue that the Patriots' defense isn't as good as the Packers. You know, I mean, obviously, this is unfortunate. The Packers, like for them, it's really unfortunate. They did, but I think their defense is definitely a lot better than this. So, I think that, I don't know, I think Seattle's going to score right around as many points as they did in this game. But I, I would expect Marshall and Lynch to be a big reason why. Okay. So, um, after this, do you, do you still think it's going to be a close game between Seattle and New England, then? I really do, and... Frankly, I'm not going to lie, I think Seattle could still win this game. I think they have a legitimate shot. I think Russell Wilson bounces back, and Lynch is still a force on the ground. But it's going to be pretty tight. I, I don't know. I'm just not ready to get the Patriots this one. I'm not sure. I'm not even sure why, but I just have a feeling that Seattle is. I have a feeling Russell Wilson will have a better game. And I think their defense will play a bigger factor in this one against the Patriots. You know what would be a, a really interesting question is who they put on Gronkowski. If they decide to put Richard Sermon on him, or if they just put one of their linebackers on? Um, that's a really interesting point. I don't think they're going to want Sherman there. I think they want him covering Edelman. But uh, that's, a, that's a tough call because Gronkowski is obviously a humongous part of how the Patriots game plan is. It doesn't matter how many catches he gets, it's how he gets them. Exactly. His presence, his presence is going to demand a receiver or two. So I'm not really sure how that's going to work. But it's worth mentioning that... Um, Richard Sherman is dealing with an elbow injury from yesterday when he was hit by a teammate accidentally by making a tackle. So it, it, it's well to see how much of a factor he is. I think he'll recover plenty fine with these two weeks off before then. But, um, I mean, I guess we'll see. I think Sherman should be on Edelman or even Danny Amendola. But um, definitely, we'll see how they shut down Gronkowski. That's, you got to think that's their biggest uh, their biggest thought coming into this game. Gronkowski is like Eric Blunt after this week. Yeah, I mean, Gronkowski is definitely their biggest offensive weapon right now in the passing game. I mean, Elman almost had a 100-yard game against against the uh, Colts yesterday. I mean, he did, I mean, he's definitely going to be a force to be reckoned with as well. Yeah, absolutely. He showed again and against the Ravens that he can also throw the football pretty well. So I, I don't expect him to do any trick plays in the Super Bowl, but just, yeah, it's just something that's out there, you know? But yeah. I, think, I, don't, I think Tom Brady's going to come into this game, and he's... He's gonna obviously he's got a lot to think about his last two school appearances. He lost both to the Giants. This is different, but you know it's. I think he's gonna have a lot on his mind coming to this game. But I, I gotta give 
I think it's the Seahawks' the edge. I think their defense is going to come out a lot stronger in this game. Okay, well, it'll be a very interesting game in, what, two Sundays. Next Sunday is the, uh, obviously the All-Star game. Well, thank you very much for tuning into our uh, Sports Heaven podcast in January. Um, don't forget to follow us on Twitter uh, at Sports Heaven 2 and find us on Facebook with Sports Heaven. Thank you very much.